so while I have you here, before we start, how many of you have been able to start up the Jupyter Notebook and then download all those lab session materials uh, so far? If you have, press yes, please. Oh, this is actually much better than I thought. So yeah, last year, I don't know if the tutors were able to tell you, but last year we had a bit of a panic because you know nothing was working, but so that's why we are trying our best to do it as early as possible. But I'm glad to see that the many of you have already have been able to do so, yes. Okay, so let's continue with our lecture on language model because it's 805, this is perfect timing. So why did we spend the entire hour on supervised learning or re re reviewing the supervised learning? Because it turned out that the language generation or natural language modeling is all about supervised learning. And that's a really interesting story that we're going to talk about now. So what is language model? We need to think about what language modeling is. So language model is to, again, to build a machine learning system. And then this machine learning system input is a natural language sentence. Of course, it doesn't have to be a sentence. It could very well be paragraphs or the entire documents. However, for this, the purpose of this course, we're going to stick to a sentence. Later today, you're going to see how this kind of system can be used to score or model entire document or entire internet. However, for the, uh, for the lecture, we're going to stick to a sentence. And then this language model needs to output the probability of the input sentence. That is, how probable is this sentence is the question that needs to be answered by this language model. And then how it does is that the, it, this, this language model does so by capturing the distribution over all possible sentences. That is, it computes the P of X where the X is a sentence, and then the sentence is a older sequence of words, X1, X2, all the way to XT. And then from this, you, you may immediately realize that this is unsupervised learning, right? And then you finally say, oh, this is where the unsupervised learning is actually used because it's really difficult to see where unsupervised learning can be useful, but it turned out that the language modeling it, which is a very important application of machine learning in natural language processing is indeed, in fact, unsupervised learning. <clears throat> However, I don't know if you have noticed, unsupervised learning is very, very difficult. And, that's, and language modeling, which is unsupervised learning, is not an exception. We somehow need to turn this problem into a sequence of supervised learning in order to solve it efficiently and effectively. And how we are going to do that is to rely on a paradigm called autoregressive paradigm. If you have taken any courses on signal processing earlier, then you may notice what this is. But this, in this autoregressive paradigm, our big assumption is that the, the distribution over the next token is based on all the previous tokens. So if I have a sentence consisting of many words, and then I'm going to pick one word and then say that, okay, the probability of this word is only dependent upon the, all the previous words, not the future word. So in the case of trying to compute the probability of a sentence X, what we need to compute is the probability of the first word. Now a first word does not depend on anything else because that is the first word then I need to compute the probability of the second word given the first word. I need to compute the probability of the third word given the second word and the first word. And then I go on and on until I need to, I compute the probability of the last word given all the previous words. And then all I need to do is simply multiply all those probabilities or the conditional probabilities. And then I end up with the probability of a sentence. Now, this equality or this, prob 
this fact that the probability of a sentence is a product of prob conditional probabilities is exact because it's just based on the definition of the conditional distributions or conditional probabilities. And then what this implies, this autoregressive factorization of the sequence probability implies is that we now have a set of or the sequence of supervised learning problems. Why is that? Because if you look at each condition, let's look at this one in particular, what we see is that that's really just nothing but a text classification where the input is going to be x1 and then output is going to be x2. Now let's look at the last one as well. Last one is text classification because input is going to be x1, x2, all the way to xt minus 1, and then the output is going to be x capital T. In other words, all we have to do is now to build a neural net classifier that's going to take as the input all the previous words and then trying to categorize the, all the previous words into one of the categories where each category corresponds to ne possible next token. So it, it's now clear that it's a text classification problem, right? Very interesting in my opinion. Now, let's see, how would we build such a text classifier? Last week, Eduardo probably has taught you how to build a text classifier extremely well. So you can think about using any of those methodologies from last week to build this text classifier that's going to let you build a language model. Now, in this case, we're going to just go through it at a very high level of abstraction. And then what is that level of abstraction we're going to operate? is the directed acyclic graph. So for each conditional, we want to have a single cl a sentence classifier or the other way around to say is that we want to have one sentence classifier that's going to work for any kind of conditional probability. And then what happens here is that we have the input that is x1 x2 all the way to xt minus 1. So we're going to consider computing the probability of xt given x1 all the way to xt minus 1. So the input is going to be x1, x2, xt minus 1. And then as you learned last week, we first need to turn each and every one of these words into a continuous vector using a table lookup or the word embedding, right? So this is table lookup, or sometimes we call it word embedding. And then this table lookup turns this discrete token into a continuous vector. And then these continuous vectors are going to go into a some kind of directed acyclic graph, right? That's going to try to extract the sentence representation. What do I mean by the sentence representation? This is the continuous representation that's going to give us the rep that's going to represent the entire part sequence or the, all the previous words. And then the answer to the question that is, are these tokens words is yes and or no, because we're not going to stick to the words necessarily. It could be characters, it could be words, it could be sub words, and then Serious did not mention it could very well be bytes as well, right? However, we're going to work at a very high level abstraction. You're going to learn what kind of representation we get over the lab sessions specifically. And then once we get this kind of sentence representation, that is the output of this directed acyclic graph, we can have yet another arbitrary subgraph. So because we might want to make a very deep network here, and then that network is going to have some kind of represent uh, parameters theta. And then output of that should be the R size of the vocabulary. So where the V is a vocabulary. And then what is this vocabulary? If we go back, is the all possible next tokens. So vocabulary consists of all possible next tokens. And then we need to get a score for all possible next tokens. And then after softmax, what we get out of is this probability. 
So what is the probability categorical distribution over all possible next tokens given all the previous tokens? Now, there is a question about the definition of word embedding, but I thought you should have learned about word embedding last week. But if you have not done so, we are going to talk about it very briefly in one of the lab sessions and then where the word embedding is used extensively. And then word embedding turns a discrete token word into a continuous vector. We're going to talk about it short, uh, in, in a couple of slides as well. Now, what this means is that the, once we have this network, right? So this is the network that we just talked about. Now we can compute the negative log probability using just the next word. And then what is this ne next word? Next word is really just a word from the sentence. So in other words, it is a supervised learning where the target or the correct output comes from the sentence as well. So this is often the reason why some people call it self-supervised learning. So in other words, language modeling is unsupervised learning. And then more specifically, it is self-supervised learning paradigm where we turn a sequence of tokens into a sequence of supervised learning problems where the labels are coming from this sentence directly. And then once we do that, we can now compute the probability of the sentence. And then we can compute the log probability of sentence, which is going to be simply the log probability of the conditional, log conditional probabilities over all the tokens in this sentence. And then now once we train these supervised learning systems, or once we train this language model, what we can do with this is the scoring a sentence. And how do we score it? Is that the given a sentence, all we need to do is we use this text classification module to compute the probability of each token given all the previous ones, right? And all we need to do is multiply all those probabilities. But just a one quick thing here, we never work with the probabilities directly. We always work with the log probabilities. That is, instead of looking at this, so this is equivalent to looking at log probability of x, which is going to be sum, so over all possible tokens of the log conditional probability of xt given all the previous tokens. And then this, the reason why we work with the log or the log probability is because of the numerical precision. Because you know, if you multiply the number between zero and, zero and one over and over, the number becomes extremely, extremely small. And then because we work with the digital computers, our precisions are never enough. So what we do is we turn this product of probabilities into sum of the log probabilities. Then we can actually work with a much lot higher resolution without uh, uh, much of an issue. So let's look at you know, idea how we would use it with an example of in Korea, more than half of residents speak Korean. So first we're going to compute the log probability of in, which is the first word. And then we know that it's a reasonable token to start a sentence, so it's going to have a high score. And then given that in, we're going to compute the log probability of the Korea because in often is followed by a location. So this is pretty reasonable. So we're going to have a high score. And then we're going to compute the log probability of more given in Korea. Okay, maybe, maybe not, but it's not really so highly probable. But then we're going to compute the log probability of then given in Korea more. This is very likely because more is often followed by then, right? Because it's a comparison operator. And then we continue to do so. And then we sum all those log probabilities in order to get the log probability of the original sentence that is in Korea, more than half of residents speak Korean, which is kind of a true story, right? So now what does it give us? This actually gives us a very interesting possibility. 
So if we could build a very nice language model, this language model can be used for many things, including, for instance, question answering type of thing. And then on Wednesday, we are going to look at very specifically how language model could be used for question answering. But if I were to give you some spoiler or the teaser, let's think about this example. Now I have a language model. Can this language model tell me which of the following sentences is more correct? The first sentence, in Korea, more than half of residents speak Korean. And the second sentence, in Korea, more than half of residents speak Finnish. And then the interesting thing is, if a language model was uh, trained well, then our language model is going to prefer the first, first one because it's very unlikely that the sentence is going to have in Korea and speak and ends up having Finnish being more likely than Korean. So this would be a very natural way to score a sentence or score sentences in order to answer a very important question. And then this kind of, let's say, capturing the factual knowledge turned out to be very important. And then the interesting thing is, this is precisely the loss function that we have defined for supervised learning. So there is a question from Emmanuel. Why do we use softmax at the last layer in your graph, but not hierarchical softmax for more efficient computation of O log V? Yeah, oh, yeah, this is a great question. So we talked about using softmax here, but of course we don't have to use softmax. All we need to do is ensuring that <clears throat> the output from this machine, that is the output from this machine is going to define a categorical distribution. And in order to define a categorical distribution, we need to have the probabilities over all possible classes, or in this case, all possible next tokens, so that those probabilities are non-negative and sum to one. And softmax is a one natural way to do so. You can use hierarchical softmax, you can use, in fact, whatever you want, as long as the resulting values are probability of the categorical distribution. However, softmax is an, a very natural choice because softmax is so-called max entropy formulation of the categorical distribution, where it computes the distribution, categorical distribution or the probabilities according to the input while maximizing the entropy. So we don't want to put any kind of inductive bias on how the distribution should be. And then we want it to be as flat as possible while following the input into this softmax. So that's why we use softmax. And then why don't we use hierarchical softmax is that the hierarchical softmax is limited in a sense that the, it's going, it, it uh, forces us to assume certain type of the class structure or the hierarchical structure which turned out to be not necessarily optimal and also not necessarily more efficient in practice because the computation cannot easily be parallelized because of the hierarchical nature. So the question is, what is hierarchical softmax? I believe, uh, I'll try to answer that on the campus wire chat room later today. So, <laughs> we're so we have learned how to build a language model by building a neural network. Of course, we looked at it at a very, very rough or the higher level abstraction. However, you know, we're going to go into a more detail now. Let's go back up a little and then we're going to talk about so-called n-gram language model where we are going to work without a neural network. So this is really key thing. So we're going to say, oh, we don't know how to build a neural network now. Then how could we build a language model? One way, one thing that makes it really, really difficult to do it without neural network is that the, we don't know how to build a table that is going to grow indefinitely. So what do I mean by building a table? So at the end of the day, what this language model tells me is that yeah, I need to build this kind of table. And in this table, this is all the previous set, uh, words and then this is going to be the next word. And then this is going to a probability. And then what I need to do is I need to put 
every possible entry in this table. And then every time I have a sentence, I'm going to simply do the lookup over this table, right? This is going to be the probability table. Unfortunately, because we don't know how long each sentence is going to be, the number of possible entries grows indefinitely. So we cannot really control the size of this table in advance. And then that makes it really, really difficult. So what we do is that if we want to limit this number of rows in this table, and then how we do that is by assuming so-called Markovian property. If you remember from the earlier lectures, earlier courses on the probability, Markovian property is where we're going to simply assume that the dependencies, dependence is going to be limited. So when we're trying to compute the probability of xt, we're going to simply say there are going to be only a finite number of the previous words that this probability depends on. So instead of looking at the, all the previous words, we're going to only look at n many previous words where the n can be selected arbitrarily from let's say it's as small as one all the way to 10. And then once we fix this n to be finite, that is smaller than some infinity, then suddenly the size of this probability table is going to be limited, allowing us to build a so-called n-gram language model. And this is n-gram because we're only looking at n previous words or the n minus one. It's, it's a bit confusing from time to time, but that's fine. Right. Now, once we decide on this kind of n-gram language model or assume the Markovian property of this n-gram, uh, is this langu language model, all we need to do is trying to estimate the n-gram probabilities. That is, what is the probability of x following a given n-gram, right? So this is going to be n-gram. So n previous words. And then if you think about, recall the definition of the conditional and marginal probabilities. So in order to compute this probability, we can rewrite it into a ratio between the joint probability of the n-gram followed by x and then the joint probability of the n-gram alone. So we want to look at the probability of the entire thing divided by probability of only the previous words. And what is this previous word, word uh, pre, uh, probability of the previous words is that the, it is the marginal probability, marginal probability where we marginalize out the current word or the next word over all possible vocabulary. These equations look kind of, let's say, confusing. However, it turned out that they are pretty straightforward thing because the first one is, this is a oops, definition of the conditional probability. And the second one, especially on the denominator side, is the definition of the marginalization. And then V, again, is a vocabulary of all possible tokens. So how do we actually estimate this Sangram probability? We are going to stick to so-called maximum likelihood estimation, as we have actually learned already. And then what is this maximum likelihood estimation? The idea is very, oh, okay, so there is a question. Is V all possible tokens or all possible unique tokens? It's the all possible next token in a sense that it's all possible unique tokens because V is over one time step, right? So what are all possible tokens that could go into this one step and then that corresponds to all possible unique tokens? So we are going to estimate this n-gram probabilities by estimating these two probabilities in this form, uh, in this kind of, let's say, fractional format. And then if you notice that the, these two are essentially the same thing, all we need to do is we need to compute the probabilities of all possible n-grams. And how we do that is we are going to use the maximum likelihood estimation. Maximum likelihood estimation consists of the two stages. First stage is to data collection. We're going to toast the coin a lot, for instance. Let's say I want to know what is the chance or the, what is the probability of coin landing heads? I'm going to just toss it a lot and a lot. And then once I collect the data by tossing the coin a lot, 
I'm going to look at how often it landed heads. And then that's going to tell me exactly what the probability of that coin landing in head would be if I toss it next time, right? So first stage, data collection. Second stage is the estimation. And then this is maximum likelihood estimation. And then we're going to use this methodology or the, this framework to estimate n-gram probabilities that are these two. Now, how do we collect the data? The good thing it turned out about this internet is that there are so many written documents available on the internet. For instance, Wikipedia or the news articles, tweets, whatnot, you can think about whatever you're using that is providing you with the data. Now, this is not necessarily the case for many of the low resource languages. However, if we consider there's a few high, widely used languages, then it's quite easy to collect data these days thanks to the internet. So we're going to say that okay, we have somehow collected the data. And then once we have, let's say, all those articles or the, all those sentences from Wikipedia and news article, we go into the stage of estimation. And then how do we compute the n-gram probabilities? We're going to look at the number of occurrences of the n-grams. So what does, that, what does that mean? So we need to first compute the numerator, right? In order to compute the numerator, all we need to do is just count how often this n-gram actually happened. And then in order to compute the denominator, we're going to count the number of occurrences of the, all the n-grams of the form, that is the, all the previous words, and then with anything that follows. <laughs> then once I do that, I can just sum them up. So what the, why is that the case? Because what we, it turned out that we, how we can estimate this is instead of trying to compute these probabilities separately, all we need to do is simply count where the C corresponds to count. We count the number of occurrences of this specific engram in the entire Wikipedia. And then we're going to count again the specific engram over the entire Wikipedia, but we're going to do that for every possible next token. And then once we do so, all we need to do is divide the count of the original n-gram with the sum of the counts of all possible n-grams that share the all previous words. This is how you do the maximum likelihood estimation. If you remember carefully from the, how you learned about the maximum likelihood estimation, probably from the very first course and the very first lecture of this entire AMI program, right? Now, what does that mean? Let's look at you know, like an example. Now, I want to compute the P of university given new and new. So I want to compute what is the probability? Uh, why is it not exact? Oh, why is it not exact? Because it's never exact in a sense that the, we are estimating from the data that is the finite. We never look at the infinite amount of data and then using the infinite amount of data to estimate this. If everything is infinite and in the limit, these are all exact in fact, because maximum likelihood estimation is a unbiased consistent estimator, except that if we never have infinite amount of data and also the data that we collect may not in fact satisfy all the conditions, especially the IID, that is the independent and identically distributed assumption. So it's never going to be exact. So we want to try to estimate what is the probability of the university given New York. Then what do I do? First, I'm going to collect all those data. Let's say I collected all the data from the New York Times. So I'm going to look at all the sentences from New York Times or Wikipedia. And then first, I'm going to count all occurrences of New York University in that corpus. And then given that, I'm going to count all possible engrams that starts with New York. So I need to look at the New York State, I need to look at the New York City, I need to look at the New York Fire, I need to look at the New York Police, New York Bridges, so on and so on. So in other words, I'm going to count all the occurrences of New York alone, right? And then what I want to know is that the, how, among all these possible New York, how often did I see New York University? 
And then that's the condition of probability of the university given New York. And then that's what I meant by maximum likelihood estimation and how that corresponds to the example of tossing a coin earlier. So I'm going to toss a coin a lot, that is tossing New York. And then among them, I'm going to count how many of them ended up with university following New York. And then that is the probability or the conditional probability of university given New York as the previous two words. And this is how we are going to estimate the n-gram probabilities over the entire corpus. And again, this is estimate and uh, this is not exact because we're working with a finite amount of data without having any ability to check whether all those assumptions that were necessary for maximum likelihood estimation to be unbiased and consistent can be checked. We can't really check them. Now, there are two major problems with this kind of n-gram language model. The first one is the data sparsity, which is equivalent for us to saying that there is a lack of generalization. Let's consider this sentence, a lion is chasing a llama. I don't know if you know llama, but llama is a mammal that looks like this. This is the picture of the llama or the drawing of the llama that lives in the South, South America mainly. And then there is no lion living in South America. So lion cannot really chase a llama. However, we can imagine it quite easily. And then that sounds probable, right? So if we put lion and a llama in the same place, it's very likely that the lion, when it becomes hungry, is going to chase llama in order to have it as a dinner or something like that. So it's very probable. However, because llama and lions do not live in the same place, whatever the corpus we look at, whatever the, let's say the newspaper articles or the Wikipedia articles we look at, there will be no mention of lion chasing a llama. What it means is that if I build, if I build a language model, there is a chance that the probability of llama following a chasing of never uh, is zero or that the count is going to be zero. And then what, it, what happens is that the however likely P of A, so the O was, or however likely lion was to follow A, however likely is following A lion, however likely chasing following lion is, however likely A chasing is chasing, however likely A is following is chasing, it really doesn't matter. We don't care, 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 because one of these n-gram probabilities turned out to be zero. Thereby, the whole, the probability of the entire sentence is zero. And that's not that great, right? And then this is because of the data sparsity. If you think about how many n-grams there are, there are exponential number of them with respect to n. Because how many n-grams uh, are there is going to be the size of the vocabulary to the power of n. This is the number of n-grams we get. But then, as you can notice, as n grows, this grows extremely rapidly. And then already with the n7 or 10, the number of n-grams is larger than the entire text we have. So what, what it means is that the, a lot of n-grams, we're going to have zero count. And we have a zero count because of this maximum likelihood estimation we're going to use. If we have a zero count, the probability is zero. Or if we have a zero count, the probability is not even well defined because the denominator could also be zero. And that is the issue with the data sparsity. The second issue is that the, because, because of this data sparsity, we cannot set n to be too high. So n has to be really, really low. And when n is really, really low, what happens is that the, this n-gram language model cannot capture long-term dependencies. So what do I mean by the long-term dependency? Let's look at this example. The same stump which had impaled the car of many a guest in the past 30 years and which he refused to have removed. Now I want to compute the probability of removed given four previous words, he refused to have. Now, if I only look at this, he refused to have, the probability of removed is not necessarily high. It could be any verb coming in, any past particle of verb could have been added instead of removed. 
could have been run instead of remove. Could have been stood instead of remove. Could be really, really anything. However, as a person who has read the entire sentence, starting from the very beginning to the end, I know that removed is highly likely because there was a stump and then this stump has had a very negative impact on many guests. So what he wants to do is he wants to remove it, but he refused to do so. So now I know if I could see the entire sentence that the remove would have been a very highly probable word compared to let's say edit or created, constructed or so on, right? Ngram language model, unless N was really, really large, less than 13 or so, cannot capture this kind of long-term dependencies. And then these two are the major issues. And then as you can see, these two issues are interrelated because if I wanted to build a Ngram language model that can capture long-term dependencies, I need to set N to be really, really high. Oops, I'm sorry, it looks too ugly. Okay, let's try to remove that. I need to set N, N to be really, really high. However, if I set N to be really, really high, the unfortunate thing is that the data sparsity is to get worse. So I cannot set the N high enough. So I need to set the N small. But once I set the N small, then this model or the, this language model cannot capture the long-term dependency. So there is a weird, let's say, vicious cycle going on here. Right? There are, of course, some traditional solutions that are not relying on neural network. Especially for data sparsity, the traditional solutions include either smoothing or backup. Unfortunately, we are not going to have enough time to talk about the smoothing or backup in detail. However, the idea is that if we are going to disallow the count to be zero by adding some value of epsilon for every count, in the case of smoothing, or by backing off to a low order n-grams. So as we go back up, so we start with some n-gram. If the count of n-gram is zero, we are going to use the count of the n minus one gram. And then we manipulate it by multiplying with some value and then adding some constant. And then we're going to simply say, oh, because we didn't see any occurrence of the n-gram, we're going to use the count of the n minus one gram. And then we need to change it a bit so that it's going to give us the correct probabilities. Now, what happens if, I, if this count of the n minus one gram is also zero, we're going to go into the n, n minus two grams, n minus three grams, all the way to the count of words. And then at this point, we have to have some non-zero count because we're going to make a vocabulary that is the all possible next words using the words from the corpus. So that we cannot have a word that has a zero count. That just doesn't make any sense. So that's what we are going to do. And the most widely used one is called Knezer A, smoothing and backup. So it uses both of them. And then we're going to look into a toolkit called the Kennelem later on in order to see how well this works. So there is a question from Kobe. Could we also be a bit selective with the words in the sentence we condition on other than the most recent past one? Now, this is a good question. So instead of looking at the only the immediate previous words, can we look at a few other words? Now, we could do so. That turned out to be much more difficult because we don't know what are the important ones. So there is a chicken or a problem. However, on Thursday, we may hear a bit, on Wednesday, we may hear a bit about it from Sean who is the, one of the course assistants on how we do that. And then we're going to talk a bit about uh, these possibilities on Wednesday when we talk about the non-conventional language models. And then the alphas and betas are the coefficients that we have to learn. So these are the parameters. And then these alphas and betas needs to be selected so that when we use this back to of counts, the these are going to be still the valid maximum likelihood destination. It's a bit difficult to compute them exactly, but you can, you know, you can compute it. And then one way is to use this Knezer name, smoothing and backup, but we're not going to go into the detail because this is a traditional solution. We're going to tackle this, not using this kind of smoothing or backup, but using a neural network. Now, so the, uh, 
Unfortunate thing is that there is no traditional solution for the long-term dependency. It's really difficult. We cannot really increase then because the data sparsity worsens. And then even with the smoothing or back off, if you don't have enough data to cover all these engrams, it really doesn't help. And then the unfortunate thing is that we cannot really increase the data science indef size indefinitely because it cannot really be exponential. I mean, the, the, amount, the rate at which we create data ourselves, that is the writing stuff, is not exponentially growing. It's at best linearly growing over time, right? So it turned out that the, we cannot really solve these two problems simultaneously if we stick to this so-called count-based engram language model where we are making the table as I showed you earlier. So let's review them. We have two issues with the engram language model. One is data sparsity. Two is the inability to capture long-term dependencies. And then these two problems cannot be solved simultaneously in the framework of engram language model, right? So that's the important thing. And the more specifically is the count base. So how are we going to solve this problem? We are going to solve this problem by so-called neural engram language model that was proposed by Yoshio Benjo in 20, 2001 or 1999. So tomorrow you're going to have a remote QA session with the Yoshio Benjo. If you have, if you want it, if you want, you can ask him you know, like how he actually came up with this idea for the engram language model, neural engram language model, or the fit for the language model, which is a fascinating idea. So we often call it fit for language model as well. Now, this is precisely what we talked about earlier with the neural net based way to solve this language model. However, the input is going to be limited to the engram. So we start with the x t minus one, we go only all the way up to the n, nth befores, right? So we're going to look at the only the n previous ones. And then for each one of them, we have the table lookup or the word embedding layers that are going to compute the continuous vector representation of each of the engrams. And then in this feed forward engram language model from Yasha Benjo, he used the concatenation. So you get all those continuous vectors, and then simply concatenate them all together to make a very large vector, and then had an arbitrary subgraph that was a multi-layer perception with the one hidden layer. And then the output is going to be the real value vector of the size R V, right? So that's the size of the output from our neural network because we need to compute the categorical distribution over all possible next token. And then this is going to be computed by the softmax to result in probability over next token, so the teeth token, given x n, oh, oops, I'm sorry, how do I delete this? Okay, so x t minus one, x t minus two, all the way to x t minus n plus one. So this is going to be what is computed by this neural network. Now it turned out that this neural network automatically addresses the issue of data sparsity by generalized to an unseen engram, right? So the issue with the data sparsity in the count-based engram language model came from the fact that the sum of the engrams are never going to appear in the data. And when that happens, either we get the zero probability or we get a probability that is not well defined because the denominator so we had to use the fraction between the n gram and the n minus one gram. And then if the denominator is zero, it's not even well defined. So that was the issue. And then the issue all comes from the fact that the sum of the n grams are not observed in the training set. And then the sum grows exponentially. On the other hand, this neural or the fit for language model turned out to naturally generalize to an unseen n-gram and gives us the probabilities for the unseen n-grams that are not exactly zero. And often that are very, very sensible. So this addresses the issue of data sparsity. We're going to look at how it does that after answering the question from Amidu. Does the conditional assumption still hold when using this method? Yes, so everything is exactly the same. 
So here, what we compute again is still the conditional probability of the next token, given all the previous tokens, where the, all the previous tokens is limited by the, all the uh, n many tokens, previous tokens. So that is from the Markovian property. So nothing really changes in terms of the probabilities. How we compute those conditional probabilities have changed from having a gigantic table to this neural network. So yes, everything holds as usual. So how does it happen? So in order to tell how this feed for language model addresses the issue with the data sparsity, we need to think about why the data sparsity happens. So data sparsity happens first, a very shallow answer is that the, some engrams just do not occur in the training set, but then they do occur in the test time. If the engrams never engrams that do not occur in the training data never occur in the test time, then that's fine. That's not a data sparsity issue. However, that's not the case. And then you can always come up with a simple example where that happens. Sometimes a new name appears. And then you're like, of course, our training set is not going to have the new name. And then the probability of the new name is going to be zero. That happens. However, if you think about a deeper answer, why, is the, why does this happen, then you know, we realize that it's because it's extremely difficult to impose the similarities in the discrete space. So if you look at the text, and then if I'm going to look at the llama, how do I know that llama is similar to all the other mammals? We know that because we know what llama is, and then we know what mammal is, but if we start from scratch using only the text, how would our engram language model know about it? And then how do we actually impose the similarities? It turned out that that's a very, very difficult problem. And then because we don't know the similarities, we cannot tell which ones are similar to which others so that we can assign some non-trivial, non-zero probabilities to similar things, <clears throat> or the similar probabilities to similar phrases. So that is, if I knew that the count of chasing a cat is much higher than zero, count of chasing a dog is much higher than zero, chasing a deer, count of chasing a deer is much higher than zero, how do I build a language model so that this language model knows that the count of chasing a llama should be similar to all these three rather than simply consider it as zero? That is, how would we actually let our language model know that llama is a mammal similar to cat, dog, and deer. Thereby, the probability of chasing a llama should be similar to the probability of chasing either cat, dog, or deer. It turned out that the feed for language model can do that automatically because it learns the similarities among discrete tokens and phrases in a continuous vector space. So there was a question about what is the word embedding, right? So this is the word embedding. And then this, oops, this is a phrase embedding. And then these embeddings are how we embed a discrete concepts or the discrete input, because natural language is always discrete, into a continuous space. And then in this continuous vector space, in this embedding space, similar tokens and phrases are nearby. And then this is where the idea of the word to back comes in, where the globe comes in, doc to back comes in, sentence to back comes in, and then all those say, embedding methods comes in. And then the reason why that happens is because of the following, uh, because of the following reason. And then the, the easiest way to view it is to look at one example. Let's say we have only three examples. First example, there are three teams left for qualification. Let's focus on these three teams. Second example, four teams have passed the first round. Let's focus on four teams. Third example, four groups are playing in the field. Now, I want to compute what is the probability of groups given three. So I'm building a one gram or the bigram language model, right? So given three, what is the probability of groups? Now, if you think about just doing the count-based engram language modeling, using these three training examples, this probability of groups given three has to be zero because 
three groups never appears. We have three teams, we have four teams and four groups, but there's no three groups, meaning that the count of three groups is zero, thereby the probability of groups given three is going to be zero. However, when we train this kind of feed for language model or the neural engram language model, that is not necessarily true because of use of the continuous vector space. Let's see what happens, right? So we're going to look at this word vector space, word embedding space, or the phrase embedding space. In the case of the bigram language model, they should be relatively similar because the input is just one word, right? So the three went in as the input, it is mapped to one of the points in this embedding space. And then this neural net is going to decode out the distribution so that the teams, this token teams is going to have a very high probability. And then next, this neural net projects the four and then it needs to again output the distribution where the teams gets a high probability. Now, because the output is same, it's very natural for this neural net to map both three and four to a very similar points, not exactly same, but similar point in this continuous vector space. That makes sense, right? And then now we have the third example, four groups. And then here, neural net is going to project a four to the continuous vector space. And then from there, it needs to decode out a distribution where the groups is assigned a high probability. And then because we had two examples of that, four should actually map to one point from which the neural net is going to assign high probabilities both teams and groups. What it means is that the, now when I try to give the end input to the three and then look at what is the probability assigned to groups by this neural or the feed for language model, then this feed for neural language model needs to put high probabilities not only on teams, which would be the case for the max count based engram language model, but also on groups. Because this neural language model already knows that the three and the four are similar in this continuous vector space. And then from there, this language model knows that the both teams and groups should receive high probabilities. And then this is how this engram lang a neural engram language model or the feed for language model learns the similarities among discrete concepts of the tokens in this continuous vector space, and then use that information to assign high probabilities to the engrams that has, that has never been seen before. So in practice, how we actually learn this kind of fit for language model, I'm not going to go into this detail because Sean is going to tell you about it later today in the second lab session. But the idea is that you start from the corpus that has been collected. You're going to train this neural engram language model using all these engrams, right? This is just a supervised learning. It's just a text classifier. You do the only stopping based on the validation set, and then you report so-called perplexity. That is a some weird way to compute the, uh, report the low probability of the correct output. But we are going to, you're going to hear from Sean later why we report the perplexity and then the intuition behind it. A simple answer that I'm going to just give you is that perplexity tells you on average, what is the rank of the correct token given this distribution? So let's continue, uh, let's, before we continue, let's look at one question from Joseph. Are we using one hot encoding in this case or word to vec representation? So yes, all these words are one hot representation. So this is at this point, one hot representation. And then after this <coughs> table lookup, we get the embeddings. Now the question is, do we train it from scratch, <coughs> train from scratch, or do we use pre-training? In our case, we're going to always train everything from scratch. Once we train this kind of language model, we can use this table lookup as a word to vec or something else for other tasks. But in our case, we can train everything from scratch. At the end of the day, word to vec is nothing but a language model. Now, let's see. So next question that I want to answer now is that the purpose of doing concatenation. So the concatenation is here 
in order to know what all these previous words are. It doesn't have to be concatenation. We're going to talk about it shortly. And then is corpus different from vocabulary? Corpus is a simply a training set. And then vocabulary is a set of all the unique tokens. So yes, they are different. You build a vocabulary from a corpus. So we are running out of time, but we started, let's say, five to six minutes late. So we're going to just go for another five minutes. Now, the issue is that the, even with the fit for network, we, even, even though we, have, we don't have any issue with the data sparsity, we still have an issue, a second issue. That is that the, this fit for language model cannot capture long-term dependency because it's still n gram language model. It only looks at the n, n minus one previous words. So that's not that great. So instead, what we want is that we want to build a language model that is able to handle infinitely long context. That is, we want to have n go to infinity. So however long the sentence is, what we want is that the probability of the later tokens is going to depend on all the previous tokens, not only the n minus one tree previous tokens. Very easy way to do so, for instance, a naive way is to simply replace the concatenation concatenation with the average. Here we use the concatenation. Now concatenation means that the output of this concatenation is going to be a vector that is going to be the size E times N, right? Because we're going to concatenate them. But then this depends on N. That's why we cannot really use the concatenation if we N changes over time. However, if you use average, instead of concatenation here, then what we get is that we always get the d-dimensional vector. And then that can be used regardless of how many tokens we're going to condition our next probability on. So this allows the model to consider the infinitely large context. However, this is not a good way to go, especially for language modeling, because it's going to ignore the order of tokens in the context window. And then we all know that this is very important to know about the order of the words in language. And then in fact, tomorrow in the machine translation lab, you are going to learn what it means, why it's important to consider the order. And then you're going to see clearly that if you ignore the order, the meaning of the sentence is largely lost. And also the averaging ignores the actual counts and then we know that the counts matter. If you use twice or three times the negations in some languages that actually matters, in English it really doesn't matter, or we can emphasize certain thing by saying the same word over and over, but then if we average them simply, then we lose the ability to count them, uh, count the number of occurrences of each word in the absolute sense. So instead, what we often want to do is to build a recurrent language model, a recurrent network. Now I need to ask one question. I believe that the Alfredo already has taught you earlier about the recurrent network. So who here is familiar with the concept of the recurrent neural network. If you are, please uh, press the yes on Zoom, please. Okay, one, two, three. Okay, slightly lower than before with the supervised learning, but okay. So now we can build a recurrent network because it's a very natural way to handle a sequence, right? And here, the nice thing about recurrent net is that it can handle a sequence of variable length, and then you can handle a sequence of the un unlimited length. And it does so by reading one token at a time, and then while summarizing what has been read so far. And then based on which we can now compute the probability over the next token. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh, Alf didn't come this year. Okay, I'm sorry about that, okay. But you learned it, that's good. So it allows us to do this very efficiently and then it is very useful because it only takes constant time per step and also constant memory throughout the forward computation. This is a very uh, nice, let's say, properties that makes it really useful in practice. Because if you think about what this language model can do, it can score the partial sequence any kind of sentence that is up starting from the beginning until some point, we can score them. And then we can use that to auto complete the sentence, which you're going to see later on today, or to suggest a keyword. And then this recurrent language model can be used very, very nicely 
Tomorrow, we're going to go a bit further into the mathematics of the recurrent language model to see what kind of difficulties we run into before we go into the attention. But recurrent neural language model is used in practice quite often. And furthermore, because recurrent network is solving a very difficult problem, that is to compress the entire context into a fixed size memory vector, that's where the, this constant memory comes in. So it's going to read one token at a time, one token at a time, but then whatever it has read is going to be compressed into a single vector. But this is a very, very difficult thing as the length of the prefix grows because it needs to learn, the recurrent neural net needs to learn to compress the entire information into a single vector. Therefore, people have been using so-called self-attention in order to avoid this issue of compression. And then we're going to go into the <clears throat> much more detail of the tension tomorrow, but we are going, I'm going to just tell you that, that this can be used together with the recurrent neural net. So usually we would learn the recurrent neural net to get all these vectors. And then from each of the vector, we're going to try to decode out this softmax distribution, categorical distribution. However, in this case, what we are going to do is we're going to use the memory or the attention mechanism to look at the entire previous states before computing the actual hidden state from which the softmax is decoded out. We're going to go into detail about the attention more, but I just want to tell you that the, this is one way to make a language model or n-gram language model with n goes to infinity so that the, we can look at the entire thing in an effective way, not necessarily efficient. Efficient way was to use the recurrent, oops, recurrent language model, but this memory network or the attention-based model is a way to make an effective language model with the indefinite context. So today we have learned what autoregressive language model is and how autoregressive language model transforms the learning into a series of supervised learning. So it's an unsupervised learning problem, but we solve it as a series of supervised learning problem where the labels are provided by the data itself. So sometimes people call it self-supervised learning. And then we learned about the count-based engram language model and then how we, uh, we learned about how feedforward language model improves upon engram language model by addressing the issue of data sparsity. But of course, that still did not tackle the problem of inability to capture long-term dependency. And then we talked quickly about the recurrent language model and self-attention language model as a way to address the issue of the both data sparsity and the inability to capture long-term dependencies. We're going to go into much more detail of the recurrent language model and self-attention language model tomorrow in the first lecture. And also you're going to see today how to build these language models using PyTorch and to compare them against the feed for a uh, count-based language model as well as between all these feed forward and recurrent language models, as well as how to use the state of the art OpenAI GPT-2 as well. And if you have any questions, please do go to the campus wire, go to the chat room, ask questions. Me as well as all the other course assistants are going to be around most of the today, trying to answer your questions on the fly. And you're going to have some break and we'll come back for the lab first lab session in, let me see, in, in 20 minutes. Take some rest and then we all see you later. Go to the calendar, find the link, and then Sreyas is going to uh, give you the lab session on how to set up GPT and the Jupyter in order for you to follow through the entire lab remaining lab sessions. So come back in 20 minutes. And during that time, please go to the campus wire. There are a number of polls that are being run, such as whether you have set up the GP, uh, GCP instance correctly and whether you were able to install Zoom and everything. So please participate in the poll as, as soon as possible. And I'll see you in 20 minutes.